And we're going to see many more of them in this series as, in the coming weeks. But in today's opening message, I want to zero in on two much more important questions. Two questions. And both questions have to do, have to do with what angels and demons have to do with me personally. Today. Right now. I mean, uh, that's where the rubber really meets the road. And what I want to hone in on today in this message. All the other questions are kind of just a mere curiosity or an education, I guess you could say. But how they affect me personally is useful information. And it, and it also helps me understand why the world is like it is. As we look at this, we'll, we'll begin to see that. So let me begin by asking you two questions to ponder this morning. And I'm going to shoot the first one on the screen here. For you. Question number one. Have you ever wondered how many times in your life an angel may have protected you? Now think about that. Perhaps you were driving down the road and unbeknownst to you, a demon was going to push a tree over that was going to land on your car. But maybe on the other side you had a righteous angel upholding the tree, protecting you just as you passed. I, it sounds bizarre, ridiculous, I admit, but don't be so sure about that until we read some scripture. You probably change your mind. Or how many times have you drove up on a bad accident, mangled wreckage all over the highway? I drove a mail route 31 years, and I saw more wrecks than I can tell you about. Some of them were sickening. How many times have you done that? The ambulance lights on the road, and you thought, wow. I am really glad I didn't come along five minutes earlier or I would have been in that intersection when that happened. But what you forgot is that when you were leaving your house, the phone ran. Or you dropped your keys. Or you got behind one of them slow tractors going 10 miles an hour. And that delayed you for a time. Some people call it coincidence. Fate, karma, but is it really? Is it really? What if there's an unseen, supernatural world manipulating many of the events around our lives? I'm telling you, that's where it gets kind of creepy when you think about it. But the Bible tells us that there is a constant spiritual battle raging, unseen by mortal eyes. The, the substance of things unseen is what the Bible calls it. <clears throat> and I, I personally wondered how many of the things that happen to us are the result of angelic intervention. It's a, it's a thought to think about. We most likely won't know the answer until we get to heaven. How many times angels protected us from something so many times I've had close calls in my life. I know many of you have too. Close calls. And I've wondered, wow. Split second could have made all the difference. Hebrews. Angels do protect us. I'll show you a verse. Hebrews 1.14 on the screen. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And by the way, that verse has led many to believe that, that angels only minister to the saved. And it does seem to indicate that by saying they serve those who will inherit salvation. But regardless, they are sent to serve, as that verse says. And you recall in Acts chapter 12, you know, Peter was freed in prison. I've seen uh, uh, Sherry made some chains for the kids today, prison chains out there this morning. But uh, Peter was in prison, and it says that the angel struck him and the chains fell off. You know the story. That's power. That's real power right there. Another uh, obvious verse is Daniel 6.22. Look what it says on the screen. My God sent His angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. Angels at work. What about Psalm 91.11? Look at it. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So clearly, God uses angels in, in the service of protection. Clearly, He does. And He also uses them to give comfort and to minister to us. It even happened to Jesus on two separate occasions. 
the Son of God was ministered by angels on two separate occasions. Look in Luke, and probably more than that, but two of them come to mind immediately that I wrote down. Father, if you're willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And another one in Matthew 4. It says there, and Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now you say, well, does it still happen today? Does it really happen today? Good question. Just ask Billy Graham about it, though. You can't. He's passed away now. But he did a TV interview one time, and I saw it. He said this, quote, on many occasions, I have felt the entire weight of ministry on my shoulders and collapsed in total exhaustion. Entire stadiums were filled with men and women waiting to hear the gospel, and I didn't have the strength in my body to stand on my feet. In those times, God sent His angelic visitors to touch my body and give me the strength so I could speak His message as a dying man to dying men. Unquote. That's Billy Graham. In his book he wrote called The Title Angels, he tells the story about being in the room when his maternal grandmother passed away. And this is what he said, quote, The whole room seemed to fill with heavenly light. Deathly ill, grandmother suddenly sat straight up in bed and said, I see Jesus. And I see Ben her husband who had died several years earlier. She said, and I see angels. Lots of angels. Then she slumped over, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Unquote. Words of Billy Graham. Several years back, I saw an interview, and I believe it was on Fox News. It's been a few years ago. And it was with a man named Walt Shepherd. Some of you may have heard his story. Uh, he became depressed uh, over his wife leaving him. And he decided to commit suicide. And he accelerated his car to over 100 miles an hour on Interstate 10, just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. And at top speed, he saw an abandoned car beside the road and plowed his car into the back of it. That was his chance. It was a giant explosion. Both cars burst into flames. And Walt was thrown through the windshield and, and onto the mangled engine of his car. Survived the crash, but he was unconscious and fire surrounded him. And a hotel was just down the road and the manager of that hotel heard the crash and called the authorities. Highway patrol arrived and they couldn't get within 50 feet of the wreckage because of the intense heat of those flames. And as they watched it burn, and we're waiting on the fire trucks to come. Two highway patrol officers and the hotel worker saw two men walk straight into the flames and carry Walt out and lay him on the pavement. I saw their interviews tell the story. And they, the two officers loaded Walt in the ambulance and turned around and the men were gone. There were no other cars at the scene. They never could find who did that. But three eyewitnesses, reputable witnesses, saw it happen. And to this day, those officers believe they witnessed the work of angels. You can't convince them otherwise. Just two weeks ago, I told you about Phyllis' wife falling out in front of her house in the middle of the road. And 2 a.m. in the morning, she wandered off and fell on the pavement in the highway now, in the middle of the road. And some man came along, called an ambulance, and stayed with her laying in the blacktop so she wouldn't get hit by a car. Now that's not unusual for a good Samaritan to do that, and most of us would do something like that. But the ambulance loaded her and he disappeared, and they still don't know who he is. Was he an angel? I don't know. Could be. I just don't know. But it's possible. In the Joplin EF5 tornado that we had just a few years ago, 
there were numerous accounts of angelic happenings during that tornado, right in the midst of it. I don't have time to read each one, but you can look them up online. You'll find dozens of stories about angelic visits during that F5 tornado. Many of those people reported what they call butterfly people. Curious term, referring to the wings. Butterfly people. Google Joplin Tornado Butterfly People and you can't even read it all. There's so many stories on there. And to this day, if you go to Joplin and drive through town, you'll see giant murals on buildings of butterfly people in response to those angelic visits. Many people claim that they were protected by butterfly people. But now that begs an important question that comes to my mind. That is... Why didn't the angels, or God for that matter, save them all? Why did 116 people die in that tornado? And I, the, the answer is God only knows. I mean, that's the sovereignty of God. You can ask those questions till the cows come home, and you won't know until you enter heaven's gates why things turn out the way they do. But one, one must keep in mind that death isn't always a punishment or a negative outcome in God's eyes. You know, it's really the gate by which you enter heaven. So you have to keep that in mind when you're pondering such a heavy question. But it makes you wonder why things turn out the way they do. And it also brings into question just how powerful an angel is. How strong are they? Can they walk into an F5, EF5 tornado while it's happening. How strong are they? And when you look through Scripture, you see that only two angels destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't an army of them. It was two angels destroyed two large towns. Two. So you must conclude that they are infinitely stronger than any man. They have way more powerful than any man. In, in 2 Kings chapter 19, one angel... One angel killed 185,000 men with a sword. One. Then you have the story of the angel of death and the Passover story. The killing of the firstborn. Exodus 12, 30 says that every house in Egypt that didn't have the blood of the lamb over the doorpost had a dead person in it. Every house. That's a lot of death. Hard to imagine. Then you have Michael, the archangel. As far as we know, he's the most powerful angel that ever existed. He single-handedly whipped Satan in Daniel chapter 10. You remember the story? But the contest lasted three full weeks. Can you imagine that epic battle? If you're into video games, <laughs> that would be one for the ages right there. Took three full weeks. For Satan to tap out. But Michael is undefeated, as they say in MMA. Undefeated. But the deadliest angel of all time, you know who the deadliest angel is of all time? Satan himself. He's the deadliest. In case you didn't know, yes, Satan is a fallen angel. He fell, was kicked out of heaven, and expelled with one third. Uh, the other angels. Two-thirds remain loyal to God. You know the story from Ezekiel and other places in Scripture. Revelation talks about it. Which, by the way, that number has always kind of bothered me. I'm going to be honest with you. That's bothered me a lot over the years. Uh, One-third of the angels turning into demons. I mean, I'd feel much more comfortable if the number was maybe more ten to one. I'd feel better about that. One third is a little too close for my comfort level. But that's what it says. And that explains to you why this world is so messed up. Literally, we got that many demons expelled here, causing things to happen. But anyway, back to Satan and his power. Never underestimate the power of the devil. The Bible says that he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. 1 Peter chapter 5. Never underestimated. And by the end of this earth age, he will take billions, with a B, billions of people 
into hell. That is an angel of death right there. I, I never underestimate the power of the devil. That's incredible to think about. Which brings me to my second question, by the way. And that is, I'll just put it on the screen. Think, there we go. Why does Satan hate me so much? Why does he hate me? The Bible tells me that he wants me dead and sent to hell. Now why is that? I ain't done nothing to the devil. I ain't stepped on his tail. I ain't robbed his cookie jar. I didn't do anything to him. So why on earth would the devil hate me so much? And to understand that, you must go back to the very beginning. The Bible says Satan was created more beautiful than the other angels, and his pride welled up in him, and he wanted to be like God. And he rebelled against God. That's why pride is the most deadly sin. I mean, it's, it's one of them that's really hard to overcome. He was judged and cast out of heaven, and he has no appeal and no recourse. I, his, his only revenge is to lash out at anything that resembles God. And guess what? The Bible says we are made in the image of God. And so, it's the only thing He can do. I mean, think about that. He's seen, he's seen the wonder and beauty of heaven. And he, he, he do not want anybody else to inherit what He lost. It's like the old adage, if I can't have it, I don't want nobody having it. That's what the feeling is. He has no recourse. But here's the most important part of this whole sermon. If you don't hear anything else, you need to hear this. Satan's judgment is in the past, and he can't change it. He cannot change it. The gavel has wrapped. His punishment is in the future, though, at the great white throne. In Revelation chapter 20. His judgment is done and certain. It's set in stone. But his sentence hasn't been carried out yet. Let me show you that sentence. In Revelation 20 verse 10. It tells us what will happen to him. The devil who deceived them. Was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night. Forever and ever. There is his future fate. Right there. I, I want you to contrast that though with our situation. Satan's judgment is already known and unchangeable. But mankind's judgment, our judgment, is in the future still. We have the ability to change our destiny by accepting Christ. Please hear me on this. I, I, I'm telling you, I cannot overstate to you how profound this statement is right here. I, 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 you have the ability today to decide where you will spend eternity. Satan lost that option. I mean, that's why he hates your guts. He don't have that option. I can stand before you today and I can boldly say to you that I will spend eternity in the glory of heaven. I know I will because I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I'm sealed. I am. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And I know that. But Satan don't have that option. I can show you the, a verse that has all this in it. Look at this. This is a most maybe the one, one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible. I want to show this to you. It's Ephesians 1.13. It says, And you, that's me, and you, after listening to the message of the truth, that's what you're doing right here now, the gospel of your salvation and having believed, there's the key, you having believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Right? Sealed by the Holy Spirit of God who has given us a pledge for your inheritance. That ought to make you just want to shout, amen? I mean, is that a deal or what? That is a sweet deal. Satan doesn't have that same offer. He, he, his chance came and went. And here's the part you need to hear. Your chance will go away too if you don't accept the Son of God as your Savior. The same time will pass for you like it did Satan. Repentance in hell won't get you a cold drink of water. 
Now that's the truth. It will be too late. The Bible says very plainly that fact. I want to show you a verse that says that very thing. And it is 2 Corinthians 6 2. Behold, now, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the time of the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not the next day. Satan lost that. I tell you, he would give all he has to be included in that verse right there. He would give it all, but it's not an option. What about you? He's on the he's on the dark side of this picture. Look at this. On the dark side. What about you? Are you on the dark side too? Headed for the same fate as Satan? It's a scary thought. It's a, it's a horrifying thought. Or are you sealed with the promise of the future? I tell you what, for those of you that are saved, is that not the most amazing thing ever? I mean, it is tremendous, isn't it, to think you're sealed, set in stone, your future. If you don't have that assurance, we offer it to you here today. God offers it to you. Bow with me as we close the prayer. Lord, we, if we learn nothing else from this message, I hope that we learn not to squander our chance like Satan did. Your offer of salvation is alive and well today. But we don't know how long it will be available. May we not procrastinate. And make sure that we're sealed as the verse says. God help us to learn and to understand from this series and from your message. And realize that there is a right and a wrong side to be on. And may we take heed from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Bob's going to...
You want to stop out there and look at a new part. We're getting close to it. We're getting ready to paint this probably this next week. And after that, moving with doors and plumbing and all the other things. But we're getting closer. And uh, it's going to be neat when we get it done and have a big nursery and children's facility there to add to it. But I uh, hope you've been blessed to come. And I see Denny's with us today and his wife here. It's good to see you guys. Went on a mission trip with this guy. One of the hardest working people I've ever been around. Like 105 degree heat we worked in out there for a week on mission. And uh, I'll tell you what, became good friends and it's good to see them with us this morning. Anything before we close? All right. You guys have a good week. Be safe out there. Uh, I'm going to close with a word of prayer and we'll dismiss. Like I said, I'd normally meet you at the back and shake your hand, but we're still trying to be safe. But we're going to get back to normal, I promise you, sooner or later. Let's say a prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today that we can gather here. Uh, we're just glad to be here today and to worship you and to give you praise and glory. It's good to be back in your house, open your word, look at the scriptures and see what you have for us. We thank you, Lord, for each one that's come out today. We pray for those that are up sick and not with us. Uh, we pray as we go forward that we can uh, look forward to better days ahead this summer. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.